don't you? <laughs> if you look on the board, you see the five pieces of armor, five provisions, five attacks, five areas. Uh, if you've come the, any of the last three weeks on Wednesday, we've been talking about the number five. <laughs> and we're, we're going to conclude it this Wednesday. And uh, so as soon as Roy saw that, and he, he makes the... Uh, uh, puts the titles on the CD and DVD. As soon as he saw five pieces of armor for today's Sunday school lesson, he, he thought of mixing the Wednesday with the Sunday morning. It just, five is there. <laughs> now what we're really talking about in Sunday school, though, is the, uh, is the, uh, the seven mysteries that Paul refers to that make up the truth about the mystery that was revealed to him concerning the dispensation of the grace of God. But one of those, we've already studied the mystery of godliness, and that is God manifested in us. But then the counterpart to that is the mystery of iniquity, where Satan has a plan of evil. Just like God has a plan of, of righteousness and godliness, Satan has his attacks and God has prepared us fully for the attacks. And that was the, the purpose of last week's uh, study, just to emphasize the fact that, that the whole armor of God prepares you for all the attacks of the devil. And sometimes you just think that it's overwhelming uh, the way that Satan attacks us. But the truth of the matter is there's only five different ways he attacks. Now, he can find several ways to do that in the five different areas, but God gives us five pieces of armor, and if you put on the whole armor of God, it'll protect you from the wiles of the devil, the tricks of the devil. Uh, so again, just to start out reading and, 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 uh, and add the one piece of offensive weaponry that, that we're given, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren... And, and it's really good to see this connection into all the book of Ephesians, and we did that as well, as we learn our position in the first three chapters, and then our walk starting at the, well, the prayer about our walk at the end of chapter three, and then our, our, our uh, uh, exhortation to walk as children of light and so forth from Ephesians four all the way through five. Then when you come to this part of chapter six, uh, it is our stand, and it's a warfare stand. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on a breast, the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So I, I read that verses 18 through 20 there because Paul talks about praying for all, with all the saints, uh, uh, praying always with all prayer and supplication for uh, in the Spirit. And so you're praying for, at the end of the verse, all the saints and for Paul concerning him speaking boldly about the mystery of the gospel. And we've already, that's where we started, talking about the mystery of the gospel, the first aspect. And I told you then that the mystery of the gospel was more than the gospel, but it includes the very introduction of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Uh, but the whole point is, is the attack of Satan is against the mystery of the gospel. It's against the very mystery because that the, the whole purpose of the revelation of the mystery is God's purpose for cleansing the heavens. And, and that's why we're, we're made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ. And, uh, and that's why we're not battling flesh and blood, but principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, they don't want people seeing this message... And, and then once they, they do believe the message, they're translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And the particular part of God's kingdom that we're going to dwell in is His heavenly kingdom. 
and uh, and so the, the, we're a direct attack of Satan and his, and his demonic forces, his angels. And uh, but God has given us a, a armament that would protect us from from the wiles of the devil. We've already talked about the fact that we're more than conquerors through him that loved us, and so there's only the Satan's tricks left, and God has prepared us ahead of time before that. Uh, in fact, it doesn't really say what the attacks of the devil are, but I asked you last time is to look at this and realize there's five pieces of armor, because, uh, as I said it last week, those five pieces of armor are going to protect you from the wiles of the devil. The whole armor of God will protect you fully from all the attacks of Satan. And, uh, and, and those five pieces of armor, you've got the physical description of armor, but you have the, the, what that protects. And each one is associated with, uh, you know, it's not a physical girdle, it's, it's girded about with truth. And, and so there's five provisions that God has given us uh, as protection, because once you know this, you're prepared against the attacks of the devil. God doesn't have to warn you about the, the attacks of the devil and say, but I gave you this. He prepares you ahead of time so that if you put on the armor of God, when the attacks come, you're already prepared before it ever came. And, uh, and then those covers five areas of the body, which is interesting. In fact, my list, I got another area here uh, that, what, how do I call that? Uh, uh, oh, that we're prepared for every good work. When, you, when these areas of your of your anatomy is covered, then you're able to then go out and serve. And, and the reason I read this is not only the fact that if you went out to war, there's not a warrior who doesn't go out praying. And that's verse 18, praying always. But at the end of verse 17, not only is there the take unto you uh, take, uh, and take the helmet of salvation, and then it says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You don't see the sword of the Spirit on here because we're talking about armor and protection. You, you, are not, you, are all, you are fully equipped to be protected from all the attacks of Satan. And then on top of being fully equipped in a defensive way, God gives you one piece of offensive weaponry that you're able to go and attack the devil and his forces. And that the offense is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so you're, you're totally protected from Satan when he attacks you, so you can be defensive. But at the same time, we're not just to stand defensively, we're to attack. <laughs> and, uh, and what we have is the powerful Word of God. So that, as you take that understanding into the book of Colossians, when it says that we're, that, uh, um, how does it say that? It says, uh, giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and, has, and, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. So if you take the sword of the Spirit and preach the gospel with it, not only someone that you're in the world, not, not the devil and his angels, but people in the world that Satan's already got in his grips, you take the sword of the Spirit, you preach the gospel to them, they get saved, and they end up being delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Now they put on a piece of armor, and they're going out in battle too. So you have one offensive weaponry, which is the Word of God, that you can not only be defended, but you can attack the, the forces of evil and, and, uh, and, and make a... a, a, a increase the body of Christ by, by going out and preaching. So we're, we're studying the, the uh, Satan's policy of evil, or uh, as it says, the mystery of iniquity. So when we talk about the five pieces of armor, let, let's work our way across this and just make sure that we see clearly um, what it is. When it talks about a girdle, Guys, well, I guess they have man girdles or something here, but uh, we're not talking about you looking really pretty and therefore wearing a girdle. The girdle in the Bible is a, is a belt that, that a person that went to war, part of his armor, and a very important part of his armor. Uh, in a minute, I'll show you a part where, where you realize a girdle is a belt that went around, and it, and it also supplied a place to hang some of your weaponry so you have things... You know, I, I think of more of like a military where they have the belts with the ammunition on them. Uh, but, they, but it also supplied a means by when, when it says gird up, 
your loins. The idea there too is in Bible days they didn't wear pants like we wear today. Uh, they would wear a garment that would go down and, uh, and, and to make sure they wouldn't trip on it or anything. They would take it, fold it up, tuck it underneath the belt so their legs would be free from being tripped up. So uh, the first idea there is when it talks about in verse uh, 14, stand therefore having your loins girded about with truth, that the piece of armor he's talking about the, the, is a girdle. That's why it said gird about. And, uh, and, and, you know, like, you could have a girdle made of cloth, because if you're just going out on an average or ordinary day, you would just, you, you wouldn't care about what kind of girdle you have. But certainly, you'd, if you were going out to war, you have a special kind of girdle. Come to Matthew chapter 3. Just an interesting thing, you, you wonder why the Bible says these things. Now, there's a couple reasons, but uh, maybe you don't wonder, but when I, as soon as I read it, 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 a lot of times I read something and I wonder why God said it. Matthew chapter 3. Now, this is John the Baptist coming on the scene, and in verse 4, it tells us something. It says, the same John had a raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. So it tells you what kind of coat he had, what kind of girdle he, he, he wore about his loins, and then what kind of meat he ate, locusts and wild honey. And, uh, it, it, you know, when you look at that, you think, well, okay, John the Baptist shows up. Why does God describe what he's wearing <laughs> to us? Well, one of the things that you see, if you go back to the Old Testament, he looks just like Elijah coming out of the desert. And, and the things that he's eaten are things that are allowed under the law, but things also that you don't have to carry much with you. You're free to travel. Locusts, you just grab some locusts and, and eat them, <laughs> and uh, grab some wild honey. And, and so it just shows a, a guy on the move and coming out of the desert, and, and a man who was a prophet like Elijah was in the Old Testament. Uh, but that leathern girdle, like I said, you could put a cloth girdle on, but if you mean business, you, you're going to put on a, better, a stronger girdle than that, especially if you're going to hold a sword or, or other pieces of weaponry. You want a leather girdle, and so he has that leather girdle about his loins. And, and you see that that gives him flexibility, movement, and, and, uh, and strength, actually. So you, you see the, the idea of a piece of armament starts with being girded. Uh, about the loins. And then the next was a breastplate. And, and certainly you've got a picture of a, a soldier, like a Roman soldier who's going out to war. That's the pictures we mostly see. And uh, not, when you go to war, it, one of the things that hooks into that, that girdle, fitting right into the girdle, is a breastplate. Holds the bottom of breastplate, fits on, strapped in the back. But a breastplate certainly is a piece of armor that's going to protect you when you go out to war. You want to have that on. And when I think of armor going out to war, don't you think of David? Go back to 1 Samuel, chapter 17. You see a lot, you'll see a lot of the armament here. Now, David's already saw Goliath defying the armies of the living God, and, and, he, and he makes a statement about that. He's brought before Saul. So go all the way to verse 33. It says, uh, 1 Samuel 17, verse 33, and it says, And Saul, now he's the king, and remember when Saul was made king, he stood ahead above everybody else. So he's like head and shoulders taller than everybody else. So you know, he's got a good foot on the average man. So whatever the average man was, you know, he's like a six foot one guy or something. And, and back then, I, they weren't that tall. But he, so Saul, he's king. And David, he's like a 14-year-old boy. It says, And Saul said to David, thou art, uh, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth. And, and, a, and a man of war, but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. 
And David said unto Saul, uh, and he starts talking about how he was a keeper of his dad's sheep, and, and he killed a, a lion, he killed a bear, and he killed a lion, and saved the sheep. Verse 36, it says, And, and uh, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing that he hath defied the armies of the living God. Certainly a good analogy here. They did fight flesh and blood, uh, didn't they? <laughs> but we don't fight flesh and blood, but David certainly did. Verse 37, And David said, Moreover, the Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion, and out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. He convinced, he, he convinced Saul that he could do it. And Saul armed David with his armor. And he put on a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor and essayed to go, for he had not uh, essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I am I have not proved them. And David put them off. Uh, off put them off him, and he took a staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones, we talked about that on Wednesday, <laughs> out of the brook, and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had, even a, a script and, and, a, and a sling was in his hand, and he drew near unto the Philistine, and the Philistine came out and drew near unto David, and the man that bare his, the shield went with him. Um, I want to make sure I read verse 41 with that. The first part of that is just David's putting on Saul's armor. Now remember, we're to put on the whole armor of God. And David is a sense, in a spirit, real spiritual sense, David's not going to go out in the armor of Saul. He's going to go out in the armor of God, that God is for the nation of Israel. Uh, uh, Goliath is an uncircumcised Philistine. He's defying the armies of the living God. So David's going to go out in the covenant promises of God and fight this, this Goliath, but he's going out in the armor of God. And, and he didn't prove in the sense that... I always pictured when I was a kid that here David is putting on Saul's armor. I don't even see how he could do it because he's got to be a size difference in all of this, and it's got to be pretty bulky for this young guy to carry oversized armor out into the... But he also has never fought in it. He wouldn't be comfortable. This isn't the way he fights. What was David comfortable with? A stone and a sling. And, and so he goes out with a stone, five stones and a sling, only took one. Verse 50 says, So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and he smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. So he didn't need Saul's sword. He went out in the power of God's word and, and won the battle. But at the same time, you see the pieces of armor there, and, and even the fact that the, the sword that he had was girded in the, in the girdle, so you can see how that carries the material. He didn't say he had a breastplate, but he had that mail coat on, and certainly then the breastplate would go on over that as well. Um, but the other part of that is, if I'm just kind of getting ahead of myself because of that, I'm just pointing out to you the breastplate that we're going to have is going to be a breastplate of Lord that's called righteousness. But they used the breastplate in armament, but down there in that shield, number four there, did you notice that when even Goliath, now he's, what, nine foot, six inches tall? <laughs> he goes out there to, to, to fight, and, and he has a man, verse 41, and the Philistine came out and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. That is, his shield is so big, he don't carry his own shield. <laughs> he has a man go out and bear the shield for Goliath. And I say that so that when we get down to the shield, you realize that the shield is not just some little thing, you know, like sometimes you see the little round one that they carried and, and would combat. The shield that we're talking about here is a shield that would, you could actually stand behind the whole thing. It's a giant shield. And uh, you see that, just a glimpse of that. There are two different kinds of shields in the Bible. and I want you to see the shield is bigger than just a little handheld shield. It's a shield that you could stand behind, and that's why Ephesians will say it that way. But anyhow, so in, in this pieces of armor, you've got the girdle that's going to hold the pieces of armament together and gird up the loins. You have the breastplate, and then it says feet shod. Look at back Ephesians chapter uh, 6. 
Verse 14 again. Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So shod means your feet, you already got the shoes on. In fact, if you look real close there, even in 14, your loins are already girded, you ha having on the breastplate of righteousness. When you go through this armament, it's not saying, when you go to war, put this on. It's, you got to put it on all the time. Because if you're out in a battlefield, you don't wait for the enemy to show up and say, oh, just a minute before you attack, i got to get ready. You're going to be ready ahead of time. And so you're going to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And I put a little note, most of you can't see it I, for my own reminder. When you talk about feet shod, you're, you're, you're talking about the right kind of shoes on. Because in any kind of, well, you do sporting or hunting, uh, there's always the right kind of shoes that you wear. Especially sporting events, you go to the tennis shoes department in a sporting good place, you got running shoes, and you got tennis shoes, and then you got, uh, you know, whatever kind of shoes. You got all kinds of different shoes. Certainly football, you got different kind of spikes and baseball shoes. And so there's all kinds of shoes that, are, that prepare you for that. And certainly when you go to war, they had certain shoes. They didn't just wear any kind of shoes. Uh, in a military, in the, in the Roman day, they, they would put on... Uh, uh, shoes that had spikes in the shoes and when it talks about preparation for the gospel of peace the kind of shoes that they wore I wrote down army boots by the way just as a reminder what not just any kind of shoe but they had a shoe that had spikes in it so that it would give you footing when you're out there in battle the last thing you want to see is any is you're out there battling you don't know what kind of terrain if you're up or down or whatever it is or if it's wet or dry or whatever uh, you want to have sure footing so that when you're fighting you're not slipping and falling down you're, you're a dead man that takes place so you have the right kind of, of shoes on by the way they would say on the breastplate of righteousness I remember reading this that you could it, you could polish your breastplate and if you were smart, you'd maneuver around till the sun would hit your breastplate and blind your opponent. <laughs> that would be a smart maneuver. So it, anyhow, this is all in preparation uh, in, in the battle at, for mostly defense until we get to the sword of the spirit. But you have the right kind of shoes. Uh, and, that's, and, and that's why when it talks about your shoes there, it says, uh, verse 15, having your shoes shod, your feet shod, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Uh, you're prepared ahead of time, and, uh, and of course we'll get to the, the, the gospel of peace in just a moment. But then it, it goes on in verse 16, it says, Above all, taking the shield of faith. Now here, now you're taking something. So you're all prepared for war, and then the war begins, and so you go out to war, what do you do? You grab the shield of faith. So the shield you go out there with, you go grab, and when it says, uh, above all, it's interesting that when I said it's one of these giant shields, because you've probably seen this on some war movies or something, that the shield of faith they would take, or the shield that they would take out to war, the big shield, would be that if you're still a distance away, they're shooting arrows. And that's, again, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. A fiery dart is a projectile. <laughs> and one of the projectiles it, it is like an arrow. And when it says fiery arrows, one of the things they would do just to, to put terror in the enemy or to destroy their camp is they would dip an arrow in pitch, light it on fire, and then shoot it at the enemy. And the idea there too is you're not only afraid of that arrow coming and piercing the armament and killing you, but even if it doesn't, say it sticks in the armor and doesn't go all the way through and kill you, but now your armor's on fire, a breastplate of, uh, made out of brass and it's burning with pitch all over it, you're going to be whipping that thing off. <laughs> Anyhow, the whole thing there is, is to terrorize you with that. But when it says, above all, taking the shield of faith, if you have a shield that's giant that you can actually stand behind, let that dart hit that, it's made out of some kind of metal. It might get kind of hot, but it's not going to hit you. It's not going to splatter on you. It's going to go around you. And like I say, if you see the, the war movies, when they would go out and there would be just these mass amount of arrows just flying at the, whole, at the enemy, the, the Roman soldiers would gather themselves together, would take their shield, 
and lift it and connect it with everybody else so that the whole army would be covered with a shield and it would quench all the fiery darts. So that, uh, so even there, it, when it says taking the shield of faith, uh, above all, taking the shield of faith, above all, uh, seems to have that implication to it. It would also talk, uh, remind you about the importance of the whole body of Christ putting on the armor of God, not just you the individual and standing with the other members of the body of Christ in this time of battle and warfare. But either way, if you're by yourself, you'll have a shield that can protect you fully from it, from all the fiery darts of the wicked. And then verse 17, it says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But we'll just take the helmet of salvation. Is The battle's going, you grab that, you're, you're all ready to go, but now, now it's time to go to battle. You put that helmet on, and you grab that, that shield, and you go out to war. When you put on a helmet of salvation, certainly, like, a helmet protects the head. That's an important part of the body. And, and, and it, is all, it also is associated with the mind in the sense that when you go out there, if you're in battle, there's certain things that you don't want to have to worry about, like getting hit in the head. <laughs> you know, you, you got you got to use your eyes, you got to go out, you got to pull that armor down or walk around it or, you know, work with, with a battle. So you want the armor that's going to protect an important part of your body and certainly a helmet, the, uh, which is called the hope of salvation. So you have those pieces of armor there that, that are going to protect you physically, but we're not talking about a physical battle. So we're not fighting flesh and blow, bones, flesh and bones, flesh and blood, but we're, we're fighting principalities, power, spiritual wickedness in high places. So all these represent a spiritual truth. Man, a lifetime goes fast. So girded about, it says, have your loins girded about with truth. So the girdle that we're to have around us is a girdle of truth. And, and by the way, that's the first thing that you're supposed to put on. And when you talk about truth, you certainly know that, that the word of God, the sword of the spirit, is what you're going to go out and fight with. But you've already been in God's word and hopefully have learned to rightly divide the word of truth. Because we're talking in this passage, we don't fight with flesh and blood. But the Old Testament, they did. The Old Testament, you want the physical girdle on. But when you realize the spiritual warfare that we're in, then you realize, okay, I don't really need a physical girdle. Israel did. But if you're going to rightly divide the word of truth, then you're going to put on the truth that you're, that's for you today. I think of Ephesians, well, you're in Ephesians. Look at Ephesians 1 and verse 13. It says, in whom ye also trusted, that is in Christ, after that ye heard the word of truth. What is that word of truth? The gospel of your salvation. <laughs> so, you know, that's just one area of truth, the gospel of your salvation. But, but when he says, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you don't want to be girded around with the truth of Israel's salvation. That's not going to protect you in a warfare. <laughs> you want to be girded about, well, you need to, I keep point, holding that because you need to rightly divide the word of truth. All the Bible's true. Everything God said to Israel is true. It's true for them. What God says to us is truth for us. And you need to be girded about with the truth that's for us in this age of grace and what God's purpose for the body of Christ is. And, and that girdle is what's going to give you strength to go out in battle and to go out and face the enemy. Again, we just close, uh, we'll come back to it next week. But the attack, if God has given you a girdle of truth, and that's a provision against the attacks of the devil, the wiles of the devil, Satan's number one attack is always a lie. What defends you against a lie? Truth. And not just truth in the Bible. You girded with that truth. You take that truth of the Bible and gird up your loins with it. The attack comes and... The truth will expose the lie, and you'll be defended. So don't wait for the attack comes and then go look for the truth. <laughs> be girded with the truth first. We'll pick up there next week. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for a Bible that, that is full of spiritual truth, 
and some physical truth, especially as concerning the nation of Israel and the battles they fought and the purpose that they have in this earth. But our spiritual blessings in heavenly places, there's truth for us to glean from the physical things and see the invisible and be prepared for the warfare we're involved in. So, Father, help us to uh, put on this whole armor that we're studying and, and then take that sword of the Spirit and, and, uh, and add people into your kingdom through the gospel that we're out to preach. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.